Okay, so I'm going to talk about ergodicity in the brain. So why ergodicity in the brain? Uh, well, this is something that uh, people often ask me. Um, and it's because I'm interested in time optimality. So what's time optimality? Time optimality entails optimizing uh, the time average growth rate of a target observable. So something that you care about, like wealth or um, calories or hydration. There's tentative evidence from our group that humans can behave time optimally uh, under experimental conditions. Uh, this is only tentative, of course. Uh, we found that um, people could shift their um, risk aversion according to the dynamical settings they were in uh, in order to maximize the time average growth rate of their wealth. This, if true, suggests that humans can compute uh, time average growth rates uh, and as a neuroscience, the obvious question is, well, how does the brain do this? So I'm just going to sort of speculate a little bit about how I think this might happen uh, and also how to test it. So we know that organisms need to predict reward from uh, the sensory cues of their environment. Um, this has many functions. So, um, it would allow you to make choices. It will allow you to make anticipatory responses. So for instance, salivating uh, in preparation of a food reward. Uh, it may serve you, um, it may help with planning, with building causal models of the, of the world that can help you exploit um, rewards from your environment. So uh, a classic uh, setup might be um, to think of a, a, a stimulus, like a, a fractal image uh, leading to a a reward at time t. So reward is a, a random variable. And you can think of um, this variable as maybe having um, different reward values. Um, so for instance, different magnitudes of uh, juice, uh, the volume of juice. And there may be a probability distribution attached to each of these different uh, magnitudes. Um, so the, the animal is trying to learn uh, what what's the reward associated with the stimulus? Maybe it's trying to estimate the average reward or um, maybe the, the prob reward probability distribution. So I'll start with a classical model of reward prediction because it's perhaps easiest to draw out the some important parallels that I'd like to um, make. So in this classical model from Bush and Mostella, rewards are predicted recursively. So um, a brackets T is the reward predicted in the previous trial of the experiment. Um, this term here is the reward prediction error. It's the, it's the difference, the error, between the reward experienced at T plus delta T and the previous prediction at time T. And that's weighted, that learning, uh, that's this, this error is weighted by a learning rate. Um, and then together, that weighted prediction error is used to update the previous prediction into the new prediction. So that's your next prediction for the reward in the next trial. So I'm gonna just introduce uh, dopamine as a reward signal. Uh, so dopamine neurons, DA is dopamine. Dopamine neurons broadcast reward signals from the midbrain to the rest of the brain, and this drives learning and plasticity, amongst many other things. So this is a nice illustration of the dopamine system here, you have the, um, the midbrain, you have the cell bodies of the dopamine neurons located within these uh, small nuclei, and then the white arrows illustrate axonal projections projecting out into the, to the rest of the brain. And this allows dopamine signals to, to, to be broadcast across the brain for coordinated learning and plasticity. So dopamine signals are multifaceted. They operate over different timescales and they have sensory and reward components to them. I'm going to talk mainly about the reward component. So if you were to stick an electrode into um, a dopamine cell in, in, in the midbrain, um, you might see a response uh, to a stimulus if that stimulus is paired with a, a subsequent reward. So this phasic signal is well modeled by the reward prediction error that we've seen in the in this previous uh, equation. And then subsequent equations um, are more sophisticated in terms of predicting the future. But again, it's the, it's the prediction error component that seems to be associated um, with, with dopamine, particularly the phasic dopamine signal. Now this 
sort of begs the question, well, could the signal afford learning of time average growth rates? So could it be used to drive learning of time average growth rates? So let's start by thinking about what it would take to compute the time average reward. So let's just start with some notation. So t is equal to the, the sum start time. This could be the start of the experiment. Um, plus uh, t, which is the number of periods, times the duration of those periods. So the periods could be like the, tri the trial duration um, of, the, uh, of the experiment. So the finite time average reward um, is equal to basically the sum of the rewards over summed over the period of the experiment, or up until t, uh, and then divided by the number of uh, time instances in which the reward has happened. Um, so this is a this is a random variable. Um, it will fluctuate um, because you've only have a finite sample of those rewards. Um, in the long time limit, uh, it becomes a, a scalar. So I should note that this to calculate this, it requires a memory of, of the past reward. So um, this this could, in principle, be quite quite a long um, period over which to, to to remember all the previous rewards. This may be problematic uh, in terms of the amount of memory required. Uh, which may cost memory, sorry, may cost energy, um, which may have fitness consequences. Uh, so there may be more biologically plausible ways of calculating finite time average reward that I'll show you in the next slide. Um, I'll just point out what the units of these time average rewards are. Well, they're just the units of the of the reward. So if it's if it's food, you might be interested in the in the energy content kilojoules. If it's hydration, you might be interested in the cubic meters of uh, liquid or so forth. So computing time average reward as an update. So you can you can basically rearrange the, the equation or re-express it um, such that it's now only relying, you only need to memorize the previous uh, prediction and you don't need to remember all the past rewards. So this might be more biologically plausible way of um, uh, generating an estimate of the finite time average reward. Uh, you'll notice that um, it's actually very similar to the reward prediction equation I just showed you. Uh, it's just got different different uh, naming of variables, but ultimately it's the same equation, um, or it's very similar uh, similar at least. So if you think about the this as the previous uh, prediction, um, and this is the prediction error, so the error between what was uh, observed and what was predicted. And this is the weighting of the error. So the the difference uh, is really uh, in this term here. This would normally be a constant, whereas this is updating as a function of the number of rewards uh, observed. And then this this prediction error is weighted and used to update the previous prediction into the updated prediction. So the only difference is really in how the prediction error is weighted. And this kind of provokes the obvious question, well, are dopaminergic reward prediction errors computing a time average? Because, well, if this is the best model of dopamine reward prediction errors, then, or the best model of phasic dopamine, or at least models of this sort are a good model of uh, phasic dopamine, then maybe this model um, um, is also good. Uh, and if it is, then it would indicate that it's the time average reward that's being calculated. Um, but you might you might question whether time average reward is the relevant thing to calculate. Um, ar arguably, reward rates are more biologically uh, relevant. So reward rates are rarely computed in um, in these types of theories, and time duration is typically omitted uh, in these models. Uh, so time would normally be used to index, like trials, for instance. But it's not the durations are not. Uh, typically explicitly stated. So if you include time durations just um, just very simply such that you can calculate uh, a reward rate for the last uh, for the last reward so the reward given the length of the trial for the uh, for the last period of the experiment if you uh, if you define G as that reward rate uh, well that would be in if it was f food it would be 
uh, some form of power, so it would be joules per second, it could be in watts for instance. Uh, if it was hydration, then it could be in cubic meters per second, so some sort of flow. The finite time average reward rate um, is then just inputting this into the previous uh, finite time average equation. Um, So this, you could argue, might be a more plausible model of basic dopamine. But then ultimately, like, you're still not calculating the growth rate. So what would the growth rate be over? Um, well, to calculate the, the growth rate, you need to specify the dynamic. You need to think about what the wealth is, how it's updated dynamically. That's what specifying the dynamic means. Um, once you specify the dynamic, you then need to find the wealth transformation whose changes under this dynamic are ergodic. Then you calculate the average change in this transformed variable per unit time. It could be the expected value or some long time uh, average. And then that quantity is, is your time average growth rate of wealth. There is an alternative route, which is just semantically different, but otherwise equivalent. Um, the wealth transformation, you could call it a utility function. So you find the utility function whose changes are ergodic under this dynamic. Compute the average change in utility per unit time. So compute the average change in utility, uh, yeah. Uh, and then that will give you the same quantity. So let's just go over um, some example dynamics. So this is an additive dynamic. Um, where your wealth at time t is updated by an additive increment rt. Um, so for an additive dynamic, the time optimal utility function would be um, the uh, just linear utility, so just this utility function here. So the, the changes um, in utility for this dynamic uh, are, will be ergodic, and then you calculate the average of those changes per unit time, and that's the time average additive growth rate. Similarly, for multiplicative dynamics, um, where your wealth at time t is updated by um, a multiplicative growth factor, the time optimal utility function uh, for which changes in utility are ergodic would be the, the logarithm, and then you calculate the um, the average changes in utility per unit time, and this would be the time average multiplicative growth rate. There is another way to, to do this more generically, which is where you can pick a utility function, then you can find the dynamic for which that utility function is time optimal, um, and then you would calculate the uh, change in utility per unit time, or the average change in utility per unit time, and that would be generically the time average growth rate, uh, but it would have a different name depending on the, on the, on the dynamic. Um, so it's important to, to think about constraints on, on this uh, way of thinking. So biological agents can't directly access dynamics. So that's, that's a problem, right? So how, how, how would they know what dynamic they're facing? Um, and we don't really know this at all. This is, this is really um, beyond our state of knowledge at the moment. You can think about how... Um, uh, this might be this information might be provided by evolutionary priors. Uh, it might be inferred um, uh, by the the agent's generative model of the world. Uh, it might be learned in all sorts of ways. Um, we we don't really know. Similarly, um, the time optimal utility function um, agents don't really know how to match between dynamics and utility. Um, the, again, they may need to have this information provided evolutionarily um, or they may need to infer it during their life or they may need to learn it. And likewise, most agents are never given explicit probability. So they can't really calculate the expected value and they can't really wait for the long time limit um, because they'd be dead. Um, or the, the experience of, of experiencing these things may kill them. Um, so one idea is that I'd like to speculate about is that you can estimate these just via reward prediction errors. Um, so how would this work? Well, you'd have your dynamic. Uh, this just indicates uh, a generic dynamic. 
a generic utility function. We'll just assume that you, you, the animal can calculate those. The average change in utility per unit time would then just be inputting this quantity into the uh, finite time average growth equation. Um, so generically, whatever your time optimal utility function is, uh, you would want to calculate the uh, an estimate of the time average um, of those of those changes per unit time. So this term here uh, would be the you could you could call that the reward prediction error. So whatever your dynamics, whatever your utility function, it makes it has ramifications for the prediction errors that would be observed. Uh, and this would give you an approximation to the finite time average growth rate. So to, to just flesh this out a little bit more, so you can, you can go from dynamics to reward prediction errors. So if you have an additive dynamic, you know the time optimal utility, likewise for multiplicative and likewise for any generic dynamic. Uh, and that would just feed into this, this term here, and that gives you the prediction for the reward prediction error. Uh, if dopamine or, or similar systems were being used to calculate time average growth rates. So um, how would we test this theory? I'm just going to call it ergodic reward theory just until I can think of anything better. Um, so what we're planning to do is to assign fractals to uh, time average growth rates. So we have these fractal stimuli we we randomly as, uh, assign well randomized over subjects we assign a particular fractal to a particular growth rate such that we have several uh, fractals and then we show these fractals to uh, the subjects whilst they're in the scanner and we show how this affects their wealth um, and subjects will learn or in principle they should learn the effect of the fractal on their wealth uh, the idea being that they can ultimately learn the dynamics associated with each fractal or learn the, the growth rate for each uh, dynamic. So we're doing this in the, in the fMRI scanner so we can then take the data, we can, we can fit prediction error models to the fMRI data directly. This allows us to infer the utility parameters for, you know, for instance, across the midbrain. Now, if the reward prediction errors are encoding time average growth rates in the way that I have speculated, then what we will see is that the utility parameters for the different dynamical conditions will separate out. So for when, it's, when the dynamic uh, is set to, we don't have a good name for it, but we call it the minus one dynamic, then we'll have a utility parameter eta of minus one. When it's additive, the utility parameter will be zero. When it's what we call the Kramer dynamic, it will have a utility parameter of 0.5, so which is the square root utility. And for multiplicative dynamics, it will have a, a, an eta of 1. If reward prediction errors encode um, simply the expected value, this is kind of like a null model, uh, then we'd expect basically all of the um, utility parameter distributions to, to overlap. So there wouldn't be any separation according to the dynamics um, of the of the of the condition. So in summary, um, time average updating uh, suggests a parallel between ergodic decision theory and reward theories. To test this, uh, we can do our thing where we change reward dynamics or change the wealth dynamics. We derive time optimal prediction errors for these dynamics. And then we observe whether this explains the dopaminergic reward prediction errors that we observe in the scanner. Um, I, I think this is kind of interesting because the neural data provides a behavior independent test of ergodic decision theory. So um, in these experiments, um, we basically um, we have two modes of data, right? So we, we have the person in the scanner, they're behaving, they're making their choices. We fit models, we estimate their utility parameters uh, according to their behavior. Likewise, we collect the brain data at the same time. We can fit the utility parameters uh, to the brain data. And then we can see whether the, the two modalities of data agree. And this allows us to ask, well, you know, do humans optimize time averages? 
And likewise, do does the midbrain compute uh, time averages? Um, so this this is an ongoing project. Uh, it's funded by Novo. It's a collaboration between DLCMR and London Math Lab. Uh, thank you very much.